this is Robert, and welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. Now, in a recent paper in the CDC's Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, authors report U.S. babesiosis incidence is significantly increased, uh, particularly in the northern northeastern states in the past decade or so. So what is this tick-borne parasite? Why is it increasing? And what are the public health implications of it? Joining me today to discuss babesiosis and the new paper is Megan Swanson, MPH. Megan is with the Division of Parasitic Diseases and Malaria with the CDC in Atlanta. Hi, Megan. Welcome to the program. Hi. Thank you so much for having me on, Robert. Oh, you're welcome. Um, and before we get into the MMWR paper, uh, let's give the audience a, a solid foundation on babesia. It's not a household word. Right. Um, can you talk a little bit about the history of Babesia in the U.S. and how common is it? Yeah, sure. So Babesia is a parasite that can infect humans and causes the disease Babesiosis. It's carried by ticks, and when a tick bites a person, that person can get infected. We've known about Babesia as a parasite that can cause illness in humans since about the late 1950s. Uh, in the United States, the first documented case of human infection with Babesia, specifically the species Babesia microti, was in 1969 on Nantucket, so just off the, co the coast of Massachusetts. Most documented cases of Babesiosis worldwide do occur in the United States. Uh, and overall, in the last few years, there have been around 2,000 to 2,500 cases each year reported. Yeah, and, and you mentioned it is a tick-borne parasite. Mm -hmm. um, and it's transmitted via the same ticks that transmit bacterial and viral infections like Lyme yep. and like Powassan. Um, uh, can you start by talking a little bit about the parasite itself? So the parasite itself is microscopic and it's an intraerythrocytic parasite, which means that it infects red blood cells similar to malaria. Okay, and how does... Um, I understand that it's transmitted by uh, ticks. Um, are there other ways that people can contract this uh, parasite? Yeah, so as I mentioned, it, it is transmitted, and you mentioned, uh, by uh, by ticks, an infected tick, so when it, the tick does bite a person. Generally, for that, the tick does need to be attached to a person for at least 36 hours before transmission can occur. But it can also be transmitted from mother to child, either in pregnancy or during delivery of the baby. Um, but those are very rare cases to have. Um, it can also be transmitted through a blood transfusion. So if the donor has a Babesia infection and so the recipient of that blood can get infected from that the contaminated blood if they do receive it. Yeah, and, and that's kind of, that's been a pretty much a bigger deal over the past 10 or, 10 or uh, so many years. Um, and they started doing some blood testing now in blood banks in certain areas of the country. Yes. Yeah, correct. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, Megan, what kind of pathology do we see with Babesia? So most people who are infected with Babesia have no symptoms or they have really mild symptoms. Most commonly, it's uh, something like a fever, headache, muscle and joint pain, or chills. So sort of think of them as like flu-like symptoms. Um, some people can have more severe symptoms, though, or complications, especially people who have either lost their spleen due to something like trauma or who don't have a spleen, or people who have compromised or weak immune systems, sort of, so people who have conditions like HIV, uh, cancer, or diabetes, um, or other conditions. And so the more severe complications can include things like hemolytic anemia, uh, organ failure, and even death. Yeah. Yeah. Um can you talk a little bit about diagnosis and treatment? I know historically it would be uh, identifying the Babesia parasite in a blood smear. Uh, is that still the case or do we have some advanced methods now? Yeah. So there are, as you mentioned, tests available for diagnosis of Babesia or Babesiosis in the United States. Uh, the way it would generally work is a person who had symptoms would go see their healthcare provider who would determine if they need a test and they would order it for them. Um, looking under a microscope is still um, one of the main ways of diagnosing Babesia, but there are also um, PCR testing. So right. testing for for the presence of the parasite itself through, through PCR is also available. Yeah. And can you talk a little bit about treatment? Mm 
Sure. Yeah. So generally people who don't have symptoms or signs of Babesia don't need to be treated. But if a clinician does think someone does need treatment or medication, there is medication available that they can prescribe. Yeah. And just a little, a little tip for the audience. When you do look at it under a microscope, it has a lot of resemblance to malaria. Yeah. They're very similar parasites, um, yeah. but there are differences. Yes. Yes. Someone can detect. Yeah. Um, Let's go ahead and dive into the MMWR. A very good paper. I, I enjoyed reading it. Um, first, where did you get the data for the paper? So the data that we used in this paper and this analysis come from the CDC's national surveillance system. Uh, the data in that system come from public health investigations of reportable conditions, and those are carried out by state or local health agencies across the United States. And what have we learned about Babesia incidents in the U.S. in recent years, and uh, what states are changing as far as Babesia goes? Right. So uh, our first finding that we reported was that uh, incidents or cases have been increasing over the last several years in the states of the Northeast and the country um, in particular, and that it was also th but those cases were stable in the Midwestern states of Wisconsin and Minnesota. Um, Generally, most cases that we see were reported by Massachusetts, New York, Connecticut, and New Jersey, all of which are in the Northeast. Yeah. And, and in, in the paper, you put a lot of emphasis on Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. What's different about those states right now? So what we found interesting in the analysis was the changes in these states. Previously, Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont were not included in the list of states with endemic or what you could call like established transmission. Mm -hmm. um, but when analyzing their reported cases over the last several years, we could see that they had similar case counts and rates to states that we did consider endemic. So we wanted to emphasize these states to promote prevention messaging for the public and healthcare providers just to draw attention to these issues specifically around things like tick prevention. Um, do you or your colleagues have an explanation for these increases? So the, the exact reason um, for like the geographic spread of ticks and the diseases they carry like babesiosis are not necessarily clear. Um, there are a number of factors that can contribute though. Uh, so for example, the spread of Lyme disease, which you mentioned earlier, um, over the past several decades has been linked to changes in land use patterns. So this can include things like reforestation in the Northeastern United States. So suburban developments in these areas that have this reforested land um, have uh, an increased spread in these diseases because you've got things like, so you've got people, ticks, the deer, and then the tick host animals like mice or chipmunks or small rodents that are in close contact with each other in these areas. And since we're seeing increases in Maine and Vermont, do we know anything about what's going on north of the border? Um, so as far as this analysis goes, we only looked at the United States um, mm -hmm. and that's where we only track diseases in the U.S. All right. So. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, is there anything else in the paper, um, any findings that uh, you'd like to discuss that I might have missed? So I think I uh, just would like to emphasize that for people, the best way to prevent from getting babesiosis is to prevent tick bites. Um, if if you're going to go outside into areas that have like long grass or wooded areas to wear long pants and long sleeves to spray your clothes with an insect repellent. And then when you go back inside to check for ticks um, and to bathe or shower as soon as possible, as soon as you come in from, from the outdoors to wash off any ticks and to help you find the crawling ticks before they bite you more easily. Um, it's also important to remember that when you're checking for ticks that they can be really small, like the size of a poppy seed. So not necessarily sort of the bigger classical ticks you might be thinking of. And um, going back to the blood transfusion um, issue, mm -hmm. uh, can you talk a little bit about um, that risk and the testing that's out there and where it's being tested for? So, uh, in the U.S., blood safety screening and procedures are uh, decided by the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, um, and so they issue guidance around where testing should occur and, and how. Um, so that really does fall within their purview. Yeah, yeah, but the, the testing that's out there is mostly being done in the Northeast. 
correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, so there are 14 states as well as the District of Columbia that have uh, screening testing um, and they're, yeah, mostly in the, in the Northeast, so Atlantic and New England states, yeah. Yeah, very good. Well, the paper again is entitled Trends in Reported Babesiosis Cases in the United States 2011 to 2019. It's published in the CDC's Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, the MMWR. And I'll link, link to it at the show notes uh, so you can read it for yourself um, if you're interested in finding out more. And I want to thank you, Megan Swanson, for sharing your time and expertise and uh, appreciate uh, you coming on the show today. Great. Thank you so much for having me. You bet.